So the title of the session is what, why and how of concept maps. We are going to uh, use this idea, this technique of concept mapping and learn two or three diverse issues related to it. One is the technique itself and why it is useful and how to do it. And second is how do we use it for course design and how do we uh, connect the syllabus and the learning objectives in our course. And thirdly, what technology tools can help us actually create a concept map. So what you have done in terms of course planning so far is uh, we started uh, by discussing and looking at the need for learning objectives. Started with the mismatch between teacher and student and so on. Then you wrote learning objectives for a topic in your course and today in fact you wrote learning objectives at various cognitive levels for a specific topic or unit in your course. The next steps of course planning is that you need to think about the learning objectives for the entire course or at the course level. What I mean here is that the course, your course or the subject that you are teaching has various modules. Usually it is about um, 5 to 8 modules per 40 hour course is a very standard number. And then each module has topics or subtopics, again there are 3 or 4 or 5. So totally there are about 40 or so subtopics because if it is a 40 hour course we usually do one subtopic in every uh, class. And what we wrote learning objectives for were at the lower, lower as in were at the more detailed specific level. And now we have to think about the entire course and see what are, what is it that we want our students to be able to do at the end of the entire semester at a uh, synthesized level. So before you write your own course learning objectives, uh, let us look at a few examples. So I have examples from three different courses and this example is on fluid mechanics. Again I have just chosen three diverse topics. So let me tell you what these are. So perhaps you will be able to connect to one or more of them. Uh, one is on fluid mechanics, one is on basic electromagnetic theory, maybe a first or second year course and the third one is a first year course on computer programming. So hopefully a large number of you will be able to follow at least one or a, a more than one example. So for this course on flu, uh, fluid mechanics, what the teacher wants the students to be able to do at the end of the course finally is describe physical properties of the fluid and explain the consequences of this, these properties, state some conservation principles, create models of different types of fluid flow and determine basic forces and moments uh, acting on different profiles and shapes in a fluid flow. So if you look at these, they are actually at various cognitive levels. Uh, the one which says state the conservation principles are at the recall level. So as we, we are looking at the objectives, let us also try to pinpoint which cognitive level they are at. This is not written in order in terms of um, hierarchy, but it is perhaps written in order in which they appear in the course. Whereas described properties of the fluid is uh, and explain the consequence could be at understand level. Determine basic forces could be an apply or analyze level objective and create models of fluid flow can be at the um, highest create level. So the other thing you want to observe when you look at course level objectives is that they are written at a broad perspective. It is not, we are not saying any one specific topic or one specific application. But these, this is, these are techniques and knowledge and skills that we want our students to be able to learn and do after the entire course. So I will just pause for about 10 seconds so that you can read this and then we will go to the next example. So the next example is a course on electromagnetic theory. Again this is a basic course uh, perhaps even at 12th standard in some, in some um, curricula they might do it. But definitely at the first year level a lot of uh, departments run a course like this. So if you look at how it starts, it says given an electromagnetic field problem in the sense all the objectives are with respect to a situation where some electromagnetic fields are described, exist. Given an EM field problem, students will be able to use the principles of electromagnetic theory to conceptually describe 
behavior of the charges and currents. So, the first bullet here is it is actually at an apply level, but it is saying that qualitatively and conceptually students should be able to reason. The second one says apply Maxwell's equations to quantitatively solve problems and the third one is derive expressions for energy. So, it is only three objectives, but this is all the problems and all the examples in the entire course usually will fit either one of these or some objectives that are under these. In the sense to be able to conceptually describe behavior of currents and charges the student should know what is a current and what is a charge and should know the laws and so on. Those are not stated here they will come in the unit level objectives. Finally last example and the reason I am showing you all this is because the next activity is where you will write your own course objectives. So, in this last example this is a course on computer programming it can mean any language it does not matter. Students should be able to trace code and predict output of a given program. So, they should be able to read a program understand what it is saying and be able to predict what the output of that program is. What kind of a program the ones involving pointers functions parameter passing and so on. They should be able to write a C++ class for such applications here they give an example. They should be able to design and implement applications that means they have to write large code and they have to be able to create a simulation for an example like this. So, again I am going to pause here since a number of you might be teaching a computer programming course so that you get an idea of how to write course level learning objectives. The next activity is for your own course what you need to do is write a few learning objectives and I have said 2 to 4 it is ok if you write 5 do not go to 10. So, somewhere between 2 and 5 learning objectives at the course level uh, please write this and what you have to say is that at the end of my course of this course name students should be able to and write these the way you saw the examples earlier. So, you can here I will give you some flexibility either do it as an individual activity or find somebody who is going to be teaching the same course. This exercise will work best if you choose a course that you will be teaching in the coming semester. And after you do this uh, what you can do is the coordinators can post a few of course level objectives just so that we get an idea of what kind of objectives you are writing. So, let us say about 5 minutes for this activity. Again if you have any questions feel free to post it on chat ok. So, it looks like a number of you have been writing and sending uh, let me first talk about one set of course learning objectives that came on chat which is actually not very helpful most of it most of what is there is useful and is uh, written in the proper way, but there is one which is not and the reason I am talking about it is if you know what not to do you will always be able to do what you are supposed to do well. So, it is not trying to say that somebody did something wrong, but this is what you should not do. So, this is for a course on DBMS uh, it is ok if you do not know what it is, but just listen to the words wording of the learning objective. It says that students should be able to get the fundamental concepts necessary for designing using implementing database systems. So, I think that the idea is more or less in the right direction, but the moment you say that students should be able to get the fundamental concepts it is no longer a performance outcome. It is no longer written from the perspective of what students can do because as a teacher I do not know if students get it or not get it. So, instead the way to reframe this is that students should be able to design database systems using fundamental concepts of DBMS or students should be able to implement database systems by doing something. So, keep thinking of what you want to, what you want to see the student be able to do you know it is a performance think of that word perform. Similarly, it says clear understanding to solve practical problems that is not valid. We saw there are lots of problems with the word understanding it is not bad, but it is not wrong, but it is really very complicated this this beast called understanding. So, instead if you say that students should be able to solve practical problems such as give an example using DBMS concepts then you are back on the right track. 
A number of you have written uh, learning objectives at, uh, at two, so the most common ones I see are apply, applying concepts to solve problems and designing systems or designing circuits, designing algorithms and so on. And this is not surprising because we are talking of engineering courses where solving uh, applied problems and designing systems are two very common tasks, two very common uh, goals that all engineers have. So it is good that we want our students also to be able to do it. In programming courses of course we want students to be able to write programs, some of you have said that. Uh, many of you have talked about students should be able to explain the working of either a system or working of a particular protocol and so on. So all these are valid. Here is one from mechanical engineering. Uh, I think this is again fairly comprehensive that students should be able to identify different boiler types. They should be able to classify different types. They should be able to calculate boiler parameters. So course objectives also here have been written in increasing order. And there is one last objective in this set of boiler which says which is a skill level objective. So that is again something I want to highlight. It says students should be able to uh, interact with various tools using SQL. So both content specific and to skills using tools are important. Okay, uh, so I think you can stop sending your course objectives. Now you have almost all the tools you need to do course design. So let us go to the next point now. So now here is the situation that a teacher faces where most of us are at at this point. That you wrote learning objectives for specific topics and modules, you also wrote learning objectives at the course level. But the next point all of us need to be need to pay attention to is make sure that the topic level learning objectives and the course level learning objectives are aligned with each other. Because one is at specific level in the course, the other is for the course as a whole. These cannot be independent, they cannot be separate and they have to be exactly aligned to each other. So this is one point, one requirement that the teacher has to fulfill while doing course design. The second requirement is that in most courses these days, 40 hour course, semester long course, complicated topics, you have a large syllabus, lots of topics and not just lots in terms of numbers, but there are lots of interconnections between these topics. And what we want students to be able to do is actually see these connections, make these connections themselves between the different topics and different concepts in the syllabus. So as an expert in the domain and as a teacher you have an idea of what these different topics are and how they connect. But for a novice student who is learning it for the first time, being able to see these interconnections is not very easy. And when we think of our syllabus, even if we print it out in 3 or 4 pages and give it to a student, a syllabus has a long listing of topics, one after the other. And what is missing in a syllabus is these interconnections for a novice. As an expert I am sure you can do it. So there is a problem or not a problem, there is something lacking in, the, in a syllabus the way we write it even though the syllabus is where we start. One is that the syllabus does not have these objectives and it is a little hard to align these if, only, if all we have is the syllabus. And secondly these interconnections are not clearly visible in the syllabus. So what is needed is a back and forth connection between the learning objectives at all levels at all cognitive levels as well as at course module unit class level and the syllabus. So these two ideas, these two concepts so to say have to be interlinked. And so, so far what we have done in actually in all these sessions what we do is first we set up the problem. We say here is a situation faced by the teacher, here are some gaps or here are some needs and then we think of the solution. So here the situation faced by the teacher in this slide is actually the problem. And one possible solution is actually given by the concept map. So what the concept map or the technique of concept mapping helps us do is fulfill these requirements that we just talked about in the previous uh, slide. Same, these are the same requirements that teachers need to make, uh, need to make sure that the learning objectives at course and module and unit levels are all aligned and students should be able to see the connections. 
So the way we are going to solve this problem is by actually creating a concept map of our own courses. So at the end of today, which includes the session and the lab after this, students will be able to, uh, at the end of this course, you will actually go back with a concept map and learning objectives for your own course. Okay, so now let's come to what is a concept map. Uh, we have been using this word for the last 15-20 minutes and the word itself is a little evocative. It says map and there is a word concept. So the moment you say map, you get an idea that it is something visual and graphical. So concept maps, these are definitions, are graphical organizing tools. They are visual, they are actually a form of a static visualization which are used for organizing and representing complex bodies of knowledge. So this in the first bullet it tells you what what the con concept map looks like, we will see an example in a moment and in the second part it says what is the purpose of this concept map and I will just quickly, uh, I will give you a preview of a concept map and you will we will come back to it, the preview, preview will show you how complicated it actually looks. Oh, this looks, this is a concept map and I am sure you cannot read it which is completely okay. So it is visual, it a, is a visual tool, there is some organization, there are different concepts, they are all interlinked and so on. So it is clear that the body of knowledge is complicated, it is also clear that the concept map is a visual tool for organizing this. So we will come back to that slide in some more time. Okay, concept mapping when we verbalize this noun is a technique to understand relationships between, between key ideas of a concept and we create visual map of these connections. So creating this concept map by linking different ideas that is the concept mapping technique. So let us actually now work our way through an example which finally leads us to that concept that horrible complicated messy diagram that you saw. It is not horrible, of course it is very useful, it just looks complicated. So every concept map exercise starts with a question and the question is called the focus question. It is not simply draw concept map of a computer but usually there is a question and the question helps focus your, focus the different concepts to come together. So the question here is what are the different parts of a computer? So this is something in all school level computer courses maybe at fourth grade or sixth grade we teach our children and it is a very simple example. So I just wanted to walk through all the steps. So we will do these slides quickly. So the moment you say different parts of a computer you can start thinking of the parts and the way you do it is you simply list them first. So I will keep clicking on slides from 12 till almost 30 hardware, motherboard and you just list them and it does not matter which order you list them first. You simply list all the ideas that come to your mind when you say, when somebody says parts of the computer, booting, ROM, memory, uh, instructions, motherboard, CPU, operating systems, okay I will just click on a few, one by one this, these parts are being added. Uh, so let me pause here, I think this is all the ideas together. So you can take a look, this contains most of the important parts of a computer. This is still not the concept map, these are just the various ideas or various con concepts which now we have to link together. In the next step, what we do is we organize these, so right now it is unorganized, it is all, all these ideas are just put together on the page, now let us try to organize these together. It looks like this printer and mouse are output devices, uh, keyboard there is something about an input device and it is up to you how you want to think of organizing them. So let us see how the person who made this slide organized them. So they have said okay hardware and software that is really at the top no. and then they have put things like the, uh, the parts that actually help the computer run, CPU, motherboard, OS all these also hierarchically they are at a higher level than let us say printer or hard disk and all. So these people have decided to do a top down hierarchical organization. Once this is done, what is done next is to link each of these words which is in a circle. So those are the concept, concepts, link them using lines and this is what you get. 
I am going to zoom in. So, right now I just want you to see the zoomed out view. Try to observe the picture. Those concepts we wrote in those circles are here. This one. There are lines and you cannot read it, but you will see that there are some words in between the lines. So, the words are what is called the linking prepositions that link one concept to another. So, I am going to zoom in into different parts and hopefully you can read it better now. So, this is just some part on the left. So, there is hardware and it says broadly categorized as output device, input device, CPU and there is something else there. If you come to input device, it says input device are examples of or contains examples of keyboard and mouse. If I go back to the previous slide, what I would like you to notice is that this concept map has a top down approach like that. There are no loops, but it starts up here top center and it kind of goes outwards and downwards. That you can see in the zoomed out view that it has this top down approach. Okay, uh, let us zoom into some other part. This is where it started. It says computer consists of hardware and software. Software is broadly classified as system software and something else. Okay, so, what a concept map does is it has these, let us actually dissect it a little bit more. What does a concept map contain? It has these concepts. Usually, these concepts are enclosed in circles or boxes like this. It says computer, software, hardware and all the all the different circles that you saw here, each of these is a concept. In addition, a concept map has links, links are just lines connecting two concepts, there should be an arrow it, and it should be a unidirectional arrow, there, is, there are never bidirectional arrows in concept maps. The direction is from the top or the more general to the bottom. Then there are things called linking prepositions. So, on each link there is a word which specifies the relationship between two concepts and this is a very important aspect of a concept map. You may be familiar with this technique and this uh, idea of mind map where it usually looks like a radial diagram and people use it while uh, brainstorming some ideas for something new. So, there we just write associations between words and often those diagrams are radial. So, mind map is also a useful technique but it is not as structured and specifically a mind map does not need to have these linking prepositions. But in a concept map between two concepts you have to say how this idea at the top is related to this idea. Mostly you have prepositions of the type consists of is an example of uh, causes effects. So, there is some verb some preposition which links these two. And finally, if you look at this concept map most even though most of these arrows go top to down occasionally you will see arrows and lines which are horizontal. These are called cross links. So, what cross links do are take a concept which is at one end of the map, take another concept which is at some other part of the map often far away and it connects them again with a link and a preposition. So, this is why a concept map is rich and useful because it helps connects ideas which come from different parts or different angles, but later you know that there is some interlinks between them. And this is extremely useful during while do, uh, doing course design, because you might be teaching chapter 5 and you realize that there is some concept in chapter 2, which actually is very relevant and which needs to be linked in chapter 5. So, that a cross link between that concept of chapter 2 and chapter 5 is what a concept map helps you to do. So, here is a summary of the features of a concept map. We have talked about all of these. Uh, it is a visual representation, it is a hierarchical organization of knowledge. This hierarchy also is useful in a concept map, because it gives a top down view of the entire complex body of knowledge. So, hierarchy means the concepts at the top, the ones you first write are more important and they are more generalized. And the concepts at the bottom usually are examples and they are more specific. Okay, you cannot read it here, but let me just tell you what is at the top and what is at the bottom. Here it says computer, 
it's the most general it's it's what you start with here it says software and hardware so if you think of the words the ideas of software and hardware they are broad they are generalized they're def because there are several types of software it's not a single idea hardware again there are different types for different purposes whereas if you go all the way at the bottom here it says hard disk ram and rom which are more specific so the examples and the specific cases are at the bottom and the generalized terms the broad terms are at the top if we had to pick the most important thing in a concept map my choice would be that it's the preposition that links the concepts because simply saying hardware software ram doesn't tell you how they're related so these prepositions that we saw is a part of belongs to includes reason they are the ones that tell somebody and that help us understand how two concepts are related and the cross links that we talked about which connect different concepts across the map okay some uh, logistical points so usually it's top to bottom it's not radial and usually it doesn't go upwards it's just a convention the top down also indicates the hierarchy usually we don't have upward or backward arrows and there are definitely no loops so this is not an algorithm it's a, it's a static picture of the entire complex interconnected body of knowledge so in terms of what is a concept map this is as much as we need to know as to what are the features how you know what comprises a map so let's do an activity where actually you create a concept map and this has nothing to do with your course this is an exercise it's actually a fun activity there'll be a video and the way uh, the easiest way i think is i'll provide you a link to the video and if you can play the video at your end watch the video think pair share activity as usual watch the video and as you're watching the video note the key concepts into it so keep jotting down the key concepts in your uh, notebook you can play the video twice in fact i think that's a better idea it's a video from national geographic on climate change and how astronauts see climate change so we wanted an example which all of you can understand which and which has nothing to do with our domains and teaching so that we understand this we are able to apply this idea of concept map then pair up with a partner and you actually create a concept map for a focus question that i'll show you in a moment and finally in the share phase we'll do something new which we haven't done so far we'll do a peer review of the concept map with another pair so as experts in the domain and as professionals you know the importance of peer review and you also know as a teacher that it's hard to assess complicated or open ended tasks so you might be wondering how will i do a review of a diagram so for that we will provide some criteria and the main idea you want to take away as a teacher is that it is actually possible there are techniques to assess open ended tasks such as concept maps and diagrams okay so this is a summary of the activity and uh, we'll now we'll do it phase by phase so the first phase here so here's the video it's called changing earth here's the link so if the coordinator could please play it on your on the screen and what the participants each of you need to do individually is note down the keywords and the key concepts so this video is about 1 one, 1 one and 1/2 minutes long you can play it twice or three times i'll give you 5 minutes for this activity because it's it's important that you note down all the keywords so that in the next phase you can actually create the concept map i could play the video from here but you won't be able to hear the sound so that's why it's best if you play it at your end so what i'll do is let's do it in two phases now we'll go to the next phase and if you've been able to see the video start working on the pair phase if you could not see the video i'm going to try to play it from this end and i'll try to share my desktop uh, and you can view it then so those of you who could see the video turn to your neighbor and based on the videos and keywords create a concept map with your partner to answer this question the specific question is what and how have astronauts witnessed about the earth's changing climate okay uh let's move on to the next phase here you'd actually be looking at each other's 
concept map and trying to tr trying to do a peer review. So I'm not going to call this an evaluation because it's not about one is better than the other. But there is a there is an instrument, there's a tool. And what we mean by tool is that, let's say there's a technique of assessing open-ended tasks such as diagrams and so on. And the technique is called a rubric. And a rubric usually looks like this. It's a table, firstly. The columns, or the, the first column here talks about the criteria along which the review will happen. So in case you're not able to read this clearly, I'll just uh, read out some of the criteria. The first criteria for reviewing a concept map is comprehensiveness. Does it completely cover the topic which was, which was read by you or which was seen by you? Second criteria is organization, which is to arrange by systematic planning. So is the concept map systematically and hierarchically organized? And the third one is correctness, which says, does it conform to the facts or to the truth? So what you can do here, again, this whole exercise is to just give you a feel of how to create a concept map and how to review a concept map. The actual exercise you'll be doing in the lab is where you'll take your course and do it. But before you get to course level concept mapping, where you have to think about both your course and the idea of concept map, what we thought is you should get a feel for how to draw concept maps and how to review it. So how to draw concept maps you've done in the first two phases. And in this phase, what you'll do is find another pair and become their partner. And you can exchange your concept maps. Remember that all of you will have different concept maps here. None of the two, no two concept maps will be identical. Though they may be similar because it all started from the same material. And use these rubrics here to peer review each other's concept maps. So again, I'll, uh, let's spend about five minutes on this and then we'll go to the next part of the session. If you learnt any new ideas, it'll help you to connect the new ideas to the knowledge you have. It helps you organize ideas in a logical fashion, but it's not very rigid because the concept maps can have different shapes. And as you saw, different people may have different concept maps. This last point is what the concept maps are recommended for for the most and especially if you think of using concept maps as a tool in your course for not for course planning but if you want your students to be able to use it it is said that by doing the activity of concept maps a student can move from some rote learning to more meaningful learning so in your particular course the reason to use concept maps are that it will help you create a big picture of the course and we said earlier that different elements of the course need to be linked to each other. It, and let's look at the first point first and then we'll come back to the second and third point. So we'll do an example here. Okay. Before doing the example, uh, I'm going to just pause on this slide. This is how exact, these are the steps you will use to construct the concept map for the course. The same list is there in your lab assignment also. But what I'd like you to do now is read this list and uh, my colleague Madhuri Madhukurve will do an example for you on how to construct a concept map and she's doing it for her course. So she will in fact follow these steps in order. And as she's doing it, you can try to uh, connect it to these ideas. So first what she'll do is identify two concepts in her course. And then she'll, let, let's do two steps and then we'll come back to this slide. So she'll identify the key concepts and then she'll rank these concepts from most important or most general to the next most important and to the next most important and so on. So uh, tell us which course you're going and huh. what uh, the concepts are. So I'm starting with the digital logic circuit, the same course where I've given example for learning objectives. The first step is identify key concepts in your course. Yeah. And so write them. Yeah, so the course is on digital logic design. So the first one is the digital logic circuit for which I will write, a, this is a course for which I will write key concepts or we can say that since we are generating it for a course level, definitely the modules which will go and what are the lessons. So in order to write key ideas, I will just start writing key ideas. 
when I talk about a digital logic circuit, the key ideas will be one of them is sequential circuits. Then there can be combinational circuits. Then we can write basic gates. So, you can see that I have listed few concepts here for digital logic circuits. It can be sequential circuits, it can be combinational circuits, then basic gates number systems, truth tables, flip flops, then basic gates like AND or NOT gates or it can be even universal gates like NAND, NOR gates. There can be finite states machines, then arithmetic circuits will be there, multiplexers, demultiplexers, then there can be decoders, there can be binary, octal, hexadecimal or even conversion of systems and arithmetic circuits. So, these are the key concepts or the key modules which I have noted. Now, the next step in drawing concept map that is the next step I have to identify which are the major modules or the important modules that we have to I have to write down first. So, I have written few of the modules as a first module or I will write it here. So, after writing this concept the first one or first module which comes to my mind is the number system and definitely it is as per syllabus. So, this will be the first module then comes the basic circuits or I can say that logic circuits that is its second idea. The third important idea is the combinational circuits. Now, the fourth important idea is the sequential circuits and the last one are the memories. So, this is how from the digital logic circuits I can write this as includes number systems logic circuits, combinational circuits, sequential circuits and memories. So, this is these are the most important modules which are there in the course of digital logic circuit. Now, further to write a secondary level concept in number system itself I can further write as classified as this is a proposition. Now, number system is classified into binary, then octal, then hex system. So, definitely as a teacher if I start with this module, then the next part which I will follow is teaching this system that is I will teach all these number systems. If I take a second module suppose, then what I will write is logic circuit includes basic gates like then all and or not and universal gates as well. So, this is the secondary level concept in the concept map. Now, in order to if I just follow this link now this basic gates how am I going to realize them? Realize using truth tables. So, this is one link which I will follow. I just want to make a quick comment here. See, when you are showing the example, it is not so much to teach you what are logic circuits. So, we are not trying to focus on the content. We are picking a topic which may be familiar to at least half of you, but even if you are not exactly familiar with the circuit, what you want to try to follow in the demonstration is how starting at a general or topmost topic, one can draw a concept map all the way 
to the uh, less uh, to the more specific topics. So even if you don't understand the topic, you should be able to follow the key ideas of drawing the concept map. And if you look at the demonstration, uh, demonstration, if you look at this, you saw how starting with the top, the four most general topics were identified. They were drawn, circles were put under, a preposition called includes was put on the top, and then logic circuits was then further detailed. There was a preposition, another preposition called includes. Next set of concepts, another preposition called realize, and the final set of concepts. So this is the type of, uh, th this is what you want to be able to see. So right now, we'll do one more such uh, branch, and then we'll just connect it to learning objectives. Okay. Now, if I select, now this is being the fourth chapter in the module. Now, sequential circuit contains flip-flops. So, this is another concept. Now, in order to realize this flip-flop, you will require concept of basic gates as well. So, this is being a second chapter, flip-flops can be realized. So, basic can be or you can say that basic gates can be used for flip flops. So, this here is a cross link that is if you teach basic gates student will able to realize flip flops as well. So, there is a connection between a second chapter and fourth chapter if we, so this is a cross link actually. So, from basic gates, we can say that flip flop can be realized. So, which are the part of chapter number 4. So, this is known as a cross link. Here earlier, the only thing I would like to say is that in this live demonstration, what you should have seen is that starting at the top, there were uh, next level concepts identified, prepositions included, and then cross links between topics a little far away were put in. So, when you do your course design, this is exactly how you will do it. From the top, go down all the way at the bottom. So, for digital logic circuit, suppose there is one of the course objective is design of, student will be able to design different digital circuits, okay. Circuits. So, so, design of a digital circuit, if it is the course level objective, now in order to fulfill this course objective, I have to include which chapters I need a logic circuit, I need a combinational circuit, I need a sequential circuit. So, at logic circuit level, I may include recall and understand type of learning objectives. Like I mean first this, this is being an introductory chapter, I will write that student will able to draw logic diagrams, they will able to write truth table or they will able to even construct a logic diagram for given situation. Now once they are able to do this, then using once they know how to do logic diagram, then here I may introduce they may able to implement circuit or arithmetic circuit. So, this is little bit at higher level, apply level. So, probably I will choose only two learning objectives here and in order to develop this chapter, I will go to the apply level. So, there is a possibility that one design level course objective can be fulfilled using chapter 1, 1, 2, level 1, 2, chapter 3 using third level chapter 4 or 5 I may go with the higher level. So, this is how I can split one course objective into different levels across different chapter. So, it is not necessary that I will try to fulfill this learning objective or this course objective using only one link. We, there are links between the content. So, for every lesson I will try to set up a learning objective which will ultimately lead to the final course objective. Okay. So, that brings us to the end of this session. 
And what you'll do in the lab is to create a concept map for your own course in the manner that the demonstration was shown now, except that you won't do it on paper, you'll explore tools. So earlier, a number of you were asking on the chat window, are there any technology tools? Yes, there are several of them, and many of them are available in, uh, as free software. So the lab assignment tells you, gives you an example of one such software where you can actually create these bubbles. It's called bubble.us. You can create these concepts and the cross links and the uh, prepositions and so on. So you'll explore technology tools. You can do it collaboratively. And you'll create a concept map for your course using this tool. And then in that concept map, where you will essentially take your interlinked ideas and the syllabus, you will include some learning objectives at the course level and at different levels. And you will see how the, uh, how the entire picture fits together. 